Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The children are dismissed for Sunday school. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading from the book of Micah, the sixth chapter, starting at the first verse. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be A reading from the first epistle to the Corinthians, the first chapter starting at the 18th verse. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, 
Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. ago, I mentioned to you that I had the misfortune of needing to call technical support at Verizon. Now, you didn't think that that one call was going to solve the issue, did you? If you did, bless your heart, you obviously don't own a cell phone. Or well, having tried unsuccessfully to resolve the issue by speaking with their customer assistance team in India four times, I decided in my desperation to try a more direct, old-fashioned approach and go to the store itself. And you know, actually look someone in the eye, have a heart-to-heart, -heart, man to man, Maybe then, maybe, I thought, perhaps they might take me seriously. They're standing tall with my chest puffed out, testosterone surging, down to hilltop I went, where I had to queue for an hour. With nothing to do and my anger ebbing, it's hard to sustain, you know, anger for that length of time, especially whilst they're playing Adele singing about regret and heartbreak on a loop. And maybe that's why they make you wait so long and listen to that sort of music, so you don't, you don't just sort of go Viking berserker on the staff. And so not having a target with a name badge to shout at, I decided to do something fun, but not characteristically English, which is to talk to strangers. Now, by way of explanation, I should tell you that I am, in fact, half Australian on my father's side. And my father's father, my grandfather George, was a true Aussie. He was from the Gold Rush, Red Desert in the west of the country. And my granddad George simply assumed that everybody was his might until they proved otherwise. And so almost mischievously with some glee, I initiated conversation with a person in front of me in the line, who politely, he politely complied. He was a young man in his 20s, bearded, baseball cap, very friendly. He was an open book, guileless. And his name, this is a true story, was Jonah. Jonah was married, but had no children. He was a university graduate, but his degree hadn't been vocational. He was employed, yes, but it was no kind of career. He loved to surf. He owned a skateboard and a dog. No real plan, no ambition. Jonah was just sort of drifting through life. Now, I'm positively the worst at small talk, and so I asked him if he had faith. And he said to me, with real feeling, he said, oh, I'm a believer. Jesus has changed my life. 
Really, I said. He has mine too. So I asked what in my naivety I thought was the obvious next question. Where do you go to church? Nowhere. I think he saw the look of perplexion on my face. And he said, I tried, really I did, for years, for years. He then proceeded to name what seemed like every one of our local non-denominational friends. He counted them off. When the list was finally exhausted, he answered a question that I hadn't even asked. He said to me, but dude, I don't need to go to church, am I right? God and I are like in a really good place right now. We just, like, we just kind of hang out in my kayak on the ocean. Well, we all know Jonas, don't we? We all have friends and family and neighbors who used to go to church, but don't anymore, who insist that they have active, sanctifying relationships with their Lord but they just feel no compunction to actually show up at the Lord's house, at his convenience, to give him glory in fellowship with those that he calls his children, his beloved. Now, for some of you, this might have felt like a shot across the bow. And that's okay. I suppose it was. So let me be clear about hanging out in your kayak or whatever. There are many things that we could be doing in America at this moment. We are spoilt in this remarkable country by a cornucopia of opportunity to be distracted on a Sunday in a thousand ways. Which is to say that out there, there are a thousand roads that, if we're not careful, lead to destruction. But though I say that, my message this morning isn't going to be about fear or guilt. Frankly, I question whether fear and guilt actually have any real utility as a motivation when it comes to church. Also, I'm not sure that they are appropriate in light of the gospel. So we're going to talk about why membership in the church matters. And by that, I mean, at a minimum, consistent habitual participation in worship. That's my topic. And maybe this message for many of us, I hope, is unnecessary. After all, here you are, you're with me, but I'm not about to take your presence for granted. Furthermore, whilst you, whilst you might be persuaded, I want us to be better prepared. I want us to be provoked to action for persuading the Jonas in our lives. And the proper place to begin, I suggest to you, is with gratitude. Gratitude to God for breath. Gratitude to God for creation. Gratitude to God for the cross. A fountain of gratitude should be the thing that brings you here week in, week out. Like a hummingbird is drawn to sugar water to taste again and again, to see how wonderful our generous maker is. I'm obviously alluding to Psalm 34. Happy are those who take refuge in him. The second thing to say is that it was Jesus who was the one who started this thing that we call church. When he recruited 12 and then 70, that group has grown and grown Thanks to the Great Commission, it has taken on various different names and labels for itself. It initially met in private homes, then it outgrew those, and it met in basil uh, uh, basilicas, then in churches, soaring cathedrals. There's been disagreement and discord, name-calling, litigation. There's even been war in the church and murder, and assassination, and execution. But the church is still the same that Christ died for. And when I walk away from the church, I walk away from him. I can pretend otherwise, but I'm deceiving myself. For imagine someone said to you, 
Oh, I love you. I think you're the best. I just think the people that you love suck, and I want nothing to do with them. Often we do suck, the church. We have made some grievous mistakes. Yes, often the church looks foolish. Like the cross looks like foolishness. So we might be tempted to walk away as Verizon Jonah walked away. Or we could resolve to remain and be the difference that we long for. Indeed, how could we justify not doing that? After all, consider, consider if you were out driving your car with some friends and suddenly it broke down on the highway and you just sort of left it there, blocking traffic, got out, took the keys from the ignition, chucked them into the field, teared up your registration and license, and thumbed a lift home, bought a city bus pass the next day, or a hoverboard, and commuted to work with your necktie flapping in the wind. Analogously, this is what some have done vis-a-vis -vis the church when they decided to walk away. But what does Jesus say? We heard him tell us last week, he said to each one of us, follow me. Follow me. And by that he meant, be like me. Do as I do. And what did he do? What did he do when he saw that the world was the thing that was broken, seemingly beyond repair in its sin? What did he do? You know what he did. Paul tells us today in our passage from Corinthians, God decided to save those who believe. When one gives up on the church, what one is actually doing is declaring to the world that they know nothing actually about Christ, that the Christ that they have placed their trust in is not the Christ of history, not the Christ of the Bible, but a false Christ, an anti-Christ, a Christ of their own imagination. But there is something else to add, another maybe more subtle angle to all of this question, which is raised in particular by our scripture selections this morning. Turn to page three in your bulletin and look at Micah. Micah is a tiny, tiny brief book that falls in the canon immediately after the book of Jonah the real Jonah, the original. And here in the opening verses of chapter 6, we see the prophet, and this is about 750 BC, we see that the prophet standing in for Israel. He stands as their representative. He embodies the nation in himself. Indeed, what we see in these verses is the prophet Micah acting as Israel's lawyer in the courtroom of heaven, pleading ignorance on behalf of the Israelites as their defense, their defense to avoid a foretold, divinely directed calamity. Basically, on behalf of Israel, the prophet claims, and I'm going to paraphrase, hey, don't punish us for being bad. We didn't know any better. Look at the end of the passage. What does God's angelic representative say in reply? Again, I'll paraphrase. Rubbish. I quote, he has told you, O mortal, what is good. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. When? How? When did he do that? Here, in his scriptures. That's where. In here, God has revealed not just who he is, but also what he wants from us and what he wants for us. This brings us now to the issue of what's called general revelation versus special revelation. General revelation is all those things that anyone could learn by simply scrutinizing the universe that God made. And we can discover by observation and meditation, some important truths. But the implicit claim underlying Verizon Jonah's comment to me is that those truths are enough. 
that those truths are adequate for salvation. And that is a hugely presumptuous leap of faith that we find falsified in the Bible. Now turn the page to Corinthians. The apostle says to us here in chapter 1, starting at verse 18, he says that the world did not know God by wisdom. Rather, how he decided to save by, verse 21, proclamation. Proclamation. By speaking to us. By telling us. We might then feel close to God on a warm, bright day, watching the waves crash onto the beach, or as we walk on the golf course and see the flowers and the squirrels. But we mustn't mistake pleasant sensations of serenity for God. God is not Gaia. Christianity is not pantheism. Think for a moment on that famous episode with Elijah on Mount Horeb. Elijah's run away, he's hiding in a cave, and as he looks out the cave entrance, he sees some awesome spectacles of nature. An earthquake, a great wind, and a wildfire. And what are we told? We're told that none of those things were God. No, God was the voice that spoke to Elijah when those natural phenomena had ceased. God was a voice that was audible. It was a voice that was intelligible. It was a voice that convicted Elijah. It chastised Elijah. What for? His selfishness. It told him to return, to return to Israel, to persist in enduring community with God's people to minister to them in the particular way that God had commanded he ought. And my friends, we all have a ministry to offer one another. All of us do. We all have a ministry to offer here in this body, an image that Paul will use to great effect later in this same epistle, 1 Corinthians. Paul says to us, you Christians, you belong to one another. That's the word he uses. My friends, we belong to one another. We are each other's. He says that we are saved in order to serve each other, to be each other's ears and eyes and hands and feet. But hold on, you might protest. I get that. I understand, too, that general revelation, sometimes called natural theology, isn't sufficient for salvific purposes, that it has severe limitation. But why can't the Jonah I know just read his Bible at home if this doesn't suit him? Well, I've got two rejoinders for you to consider this coming week. Firstly... If you were to draw a Venn diagram, as I have here, here's what I made earlier. And that represented Christians who don't come to church. Almost perfectly, those who don't read their Bible would overlap. Abstaining from church and reading your Bible are so tightly intertwined, I think this is irrefutable, you might say it's like a chicken and egg situation. It's a symbiotic relationship. Solitary Bible study, on the other hand, is fraught with pitfalls. It's essential. My friends, please read your Bibles. It's essential for supplementing the exposure that you receive here on a Sunday. But solitary Bible study, I'm sure, is also the place in which all of the heresies that have plagued and plagued the church began. I'm certain. That is to say, the heresies, the misunderstandings that plagued the church began in a hubristic 
rarefied context where there weren't other equally committed, equally literate Christians to say, whoa, 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 are you reading that right? Because that sounds weird. The same can be said about discipleship. In Luke 10, Jesus deliberately sent the apostles out two by two ahead of him into every town and place he was about to go. No one, you see, truly disciples alone, disciples themselves. It's impossible. You can't disciple yourself just as a child can't really parent themselves. The result is always mess and mishap. Just give it time. Now, if we're to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God, to do those very deeds that we're told in Romans 2 will have pertinence on that final day when the book of life is opened and we're judged, then we need church. We need each other to do those same difficult tasks alongside us, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Amen.